I'm sorry for the folks at home. Hello, um, my name is Corey Riley, I'm Jeff's son. Um, I would just like to take a moment to welcome you all uh, to Cleveland. I know many of you have traveled um, long distances to be with us here today. Um, I want to welcome all of our family, I want to welcome all of Jeff's friends, I want to welcome all of his colleagues, and just say how special it is to see so many faces here today um, from across Jeff's life. and. Um, we're just so grateful to have this opportunity to celebrate um, who my dad was, the impacts he's made, and um, <coughs> the far reach of his heart in every direction. Um, and I'd like to, to start today by welcoming um, Jim Gimmelsberger, who's going to do these service for us today. <coughs> On behalf of the family, let me just say a word of thank you for being here today. Your presence, and I know your support, meant the world to Chris, to the kids, and the whole family during this time of sudden loss. It's Washington Irving who once said, There is a sacredness in tears. They're not a mark of weakness, but of power. They speak more eloquently than 10,000 tongues. They are messengers of overwhelming grief, grief of deep contrition, and unspeakable love. Everyone in this room today has been touched in some way or another by Jeff Raleigh's life. Maybe it was a class he taught, you were a colleague he worked with, or you knew him in a more personal way. Our hearts are truly broken. When Christine called me the other day, it was on Jeff's number, and I just assumed that I'd hear his voice on the other end. And it wasn't. And my heart broke because of what he meant to us as a family. What happens when you lose someone near and dear to you is a change in the heart, it's a change in the attitude, it's a change in life. You knew, and I would know that if Jeff knew where we're here right now, he would probably wrap those big teddy bear arms around you and give you a big squeeze and say it'll be okay. And now that job becomes ours, to support, to encourage, to love those left behind until the day that we join them in eternity. Dr. James Dobson said one time, there are two important things that matter in life. The people you love and the people that love you in return. And your presence here today shows that kind of love, that kind of support. And we truly appreciate it. The cards, the flowers, the beautiful memories shared in the tribute wall make it very clear just how much <coughs> he was loved and how much he was respected in his profession, by his friends, and I know loved dearly by his family. You know, before we go any further, I'm going to share a few scriptures that I had picked out and that a few of the family shared. It's in Romans 8, 35-39, that we read these words. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or person, persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life or angels or principalities, nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth or any other creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake and the swelling thereof. There is a river, the streams where I make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High, and God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. A reminder that in the midst of our trials and our troubles that God is always there. No matter how big, and these are big troubles, these are big storms. They hurt, there's sorrow, there's sadness, that God will be there as for us each and every day. And then a passage of scripture that truly de depicts what a true father is like. 
what a real father is like, <clears throat> simply in the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters, he restoreth my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The imagery there is that of a shepherd, that of truly a father. That's what the shepherd was pretty much to the sheep at that day. They would call their name and they would come. They didn't drive their sheep, they led their sheep. In the same way that a father would lead their children. The same way that a father would lead along with the side of his wife, along the same way that a professor or a teacher would teach and bring his students along to encourage them, to give them strength. Oh, and yes, those times when they would step out of the way just a little bit, that they would reach out with that crook staff and pull them back to safety, bring them back to understanding and knowing what that's all about. That's just what a father does. But what I love about that passage of Scripture, it talks about there will be times when we will be led beside still waters, beside green pastures. But in times like this, when it seems like all hope is gone, when it seems like the waters are rough and there's a storm raging ahead, we're not sure where to turn because of a sudden tragedy in our life, that God reminds us that it will be okay that he will lead us beside still waters. Not a raging storm, but still. He'll give us those greener pastures when it seems like all hope is gone, that God will be there for us, will love us unconditionally. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we can gather together. Father, to remember, Father, to honor, Father, to be encouraged to take one more step, one more day. Father, guide us, direct us. Father, be with the family. Give them comfort and encouragement in this time of loss. For many, it's a loss. As I read through the tribute wall, I was amazed that the people talked about how the world has changed because Jeff Riley is gone. Father, I know that our personal world has changed because he's gone. Father, I know this professional world has to lift us up in this time together. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, there are dozens and dozens of tributes on the wall. I would encourage you to read through those from people who I'm sure knew Jeff recently to just a few years back to. It seemed like some of those went decades back. I couldn't possibly share every thought. But I wanted to highlight just a few, and I don't even know all who was going to speak at the end. I, I hope I don't steal anyone's thunder by, by sharing some of these, but I think they need to be reminded. Bonnie Beal, are you here? Just making sure. Um, said, my heart is broken. Had it not been for Mr. Riley, it would not have been in the position I am today. I am and shall be eternally grateful for him. We became close friends when I was at school at Ohio State University we were realized what a special man, a kind, compassionate, and generous man he was. I owe everything to Jeff. I'm sorry for the new graduates who will never have the honor and pleasure to learn from him and understand his passion for teaching and learning from a true pioneer in our field. Sean Bergen, just a glimpse of what he said was, all of us taught by him owe him a great debt. We can continue the legacy they provided to us by continuing to teach and share knowledge in the perfusion and healthcare community. Mark Scheiss said, standing on the shoulders of giants. Just let that sink in for a moment. Because that's what he was. Not just in stature, but in character. The profession and the vast majority of the perfusionists 
would not be what they are today without the dedicated people like Jeff. His accomplishments in all the areas will not be forgotten. Also, never will be forgotten is his kindness. I admire Jeff greatly. We talked often during the past four or five years. He was soft-spoken. If you knew him, that's exactly what he was. But his love for his profession was so evident. Another giant has left us. There's the word again. Though his shoes can never be filled, the best way to honor legends is to strive to be like him. I hear those words. Intelligent, particular, humble, kind, gentle, generous. Those are words that define many people. But when you use them individually, you very rarely hear all those words used to define one person, which is what made Jeff so unique and so special. And truly one of a kind. There are many comments on the wall, and I encourage you to read those. But honestly, when you think about the idea of carrying on a legacy, that's what his kids are going to do with their lives. And what they do and who they are, so what his wife will continue to do is carry on that legacy. And that's honestly what he would want every one of you to do, is to carry on the work that he started. You know, it's said of family that sometimes it's hard to put in words, just what I'd like to say, but I always know you're thought of in a very special way. Though the distance is between us, keeps us miles apart, you'll always be a special place. For you in my heart. There's an old song that we sing many times in, in church that simply goes, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout for victory. Although Jeff's loss will leave an empty place in our hearts, death has gave way to an incredible victory and a time of rejoicing in the early days. And I believe that in eternity, God will make all things right. He promises that he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, nor mourning, or crying, or pain. The old order has passed away. We will not only be forgiven, but we'll forget all those times that we've sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There will be comfort for troubled times and joy beyond measure. In the meantime, those of us who are staying behind are called to be faithful. Called to do what's written in the book and understand that we can't change the past, but we certainly, certainly and most surely should change tomorrow. And I know that's what he would want me to do, beyond a shadow of a doubt, because that's just who he was. It's in Ephesians 2 that we read these words, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do, notice what this says, good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Jeff Riley was in the business of good works. Making people's lives better each and every day. That's just who he was. And I know many of you knew him better in a professional way. I didn't know him that way at all. To me, he was cousin Jeff. I've always known him that way in that sense. But he was a special person that I grew to love very dearly over the last five or 10 years. You know, whether he was a teacher, professional, colleague, or family man, we need to understand that God is there to heal and comfort our sorrows. God is there to be with us each and every day, every moment of our life. There's a poem that I want to share, and then I'm going to read one last scripture. It says, those we love don't go away. They walk beside us every day. Unseen, unheard, but always near. So loved, so missed, so very dear. That is my big, tall, strong, soft-spoken cousin that I love so much, and I will miss him greatly. It's in Mark chapter 10. Then we read these words. 
Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who regard as rulers of Gentiles ordered over them, and over the high officials exercise authority over them. But not so with you. And here's the words we need to remember. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jeff was a servant. In many, many ways, he served you. He served his family. He served people he would never see face to face. And he made a difference in the lives of not just a few, of countless thousands. And maybe even more. Because of who he was and how he lived. I know the family has some comments, and then I know quite a few of you would like to come up and share. I would encourage you to do exactly that. So I stand up here today parts of me I have because of my father. And one of the things I've gotten to learn about my father in the last five years that I didn't know prior to these last five years is just how sensitive of a person he was. And I'm going to share with you three phrases he would tell me all the time when I was an adolescent. And I don't mean these phrases to to make fun of him, or to, um, to to be judgmental about him as a father in any way, because these phrases are full of love. And the phrases are, Corey, you need to be less sensitive. <laughs> the, second, <laughs> the second phrase was, Corey, you need to have a woman for every day of the week. <laughs> Third phrase was, Corey, everything in moderation. <laughs> I think, I'm not sure how the second and third one work together, but <laughs> if you know my dad, you know he was complex. And, um, um, those phrases come to my mind over and over again, because I'm trying to think, okay, what, how, did, how was he a father to me? What did he leave? Um, in, inside of me as, as his legacy. And they're not those three phrases, even though those were the words he spoke. And if you were a student of his, I'm sure you know that he didn't teach through words very often, as much as he taught through actions and behaviors. And, and he challenged you um, as he challenged us to find the answers ourselves. Um, and you can't ask for a better lesson than that. He was bizarrely curious, and that's something I got from him that I'm so grateful for. He is um, an undying, selfless servant to everything and everybody he cared about. And I like to believe that a little bit of that rubbed off on me. And he was the kind of person that would walk into a room wherever he was, and it wasn't let me look at what's wrong with this picture. It was, what can I do? What are my skills that can improve this picture? He was always optimistic and kind and giving of himself in whatever way he felt like he could give of himself. Um, and um, he 
he was incapable of saying the word no, as you all probably are aware, and that definitely rubbed off on me. <laughs> um, about five years ago, we sat down and had a deep conversation about him and his father. And one of the things he said to me was, Corey, I wish I had more time to ask the questions I wanted to ask of him, truly ask the questions I wanted to ask of him. It was a very rare moment, by the way, of um, emotions that he would uh, share around me, um, but that was my dad. And what that did was provide me permission to ask him any question I ever would want to ask him. And I think he regretted sharing that story with me because it would make him very uncomfortable. <laughs> because as I said before, I'm a very sensitive person and I don't shy away from emotions and I didn't shy away from them with him. And he would oftentimes give me that look you saw in many of these pictures. And if you're his student, I'm sure you've seen this look. Or a colleague, I'm sure you've seen this look. It's um, curmudgeonly. It's, um, it's jowls. <laughs> just like, are you really, are you really? Like, he, he feigns. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? He feigns um, annoyance. You know, um, he does it so well. Um, <coughs> He was a leader in every beautiful way a person could be a leader. Not forceful, kind, huge heart, gave of himself. Um, he would not expect others to give of themselves more than he was willing to give of himself. These are all lessons I, I learned from him. And I'm so grateful for those lessons. I think about my mom. And I've done the same reflections. What parts of me that I find beautiful did I get from my mom? And it's, it's her smile. It's her eyes. I'm so grateful that I got those two things from her. But it is her kindness that was matched by my father's. And it was also that moment, you've probably all been there, in a movie theater where there's that one person who laughs at a joke um, louder than any other joke, but they're the only person laughing at that joke. That's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's also me. <laughs> Which every time I do it, I, I get to reflect in that moment, this is my mom. And it makes me so happy to have those moments. And every time someone tells me I need to learn how to say no, it's my dad. Moments. The last memory that I'm going to hold of my father is a description of, of what I'm learning as a at 36 year old. You go through stages of life, and I'm in that stage of life where where. You get, you get to feel every ounce of care and love your parents have given you, and you get the opportunity to pay it back. And if you know my dad, he doesn't ask for help. And he, and he certainly doesn't ask when he needs something. And, and about two or three weeks ago, he got into a place in his life where he was comfortable <coughs> asking me for help and allowing me to help him. And I'm so grateful for those three weeks. It doesn't seem like a lot of time, but man, did it mean something to me. I was that child that needed his mom to scratch his back before bed every night, and had a father who was a giant of a man, and had hands that he would come up behind you and place them on your shoulders, and every care in the world would go away in that moment. And I was with him a couple weeks ago after his ablation, and he was so weak and hooked up to oxygen, and I had to learn very quickly how to be a caretaker. And the first thing that came to my mind was, I'm gonna walk up behind him, I'm gonna put my hands on his shoulders, and I'm just gonna let him feel that. And that's gonna be the memory that I hold on to as a son. And I am so grateful for all of those moments that I've had with him. I'm so grateful for every one of you in this room who have helped share this memory. Well, 
honor him. I'm, I get to learn it each and every day how special he looks, beyond what I already knew of him. And every time I do something in my professional life, every time I can't say no to someone asking me to be on a board, um, I just can't say no. I'm gonna remember that's my dad. Mm -hmm. And he's proud of me. And he never never missed an opportunity to tell me that he was proud of me. Thank you. I'm so thankful for that. Many of you probably know that I'm a musician. And um, I wanted so bad to play today. To play for him today. To play for my mom today. And I just knew that halfway through anything I did, I would lose it. I would be able to make it through it. And that makes me so sad. But every time I pick up my euphonium and perform, I know that a part of me will be performing for him. Every single time I come down. This is a time of great sadness, but also reflecting on who he was to me and to our family and to all of you and to his community. I am just so grateful to have this time with all of you. I want to share that. Thank you so much for being here. Well, that was very much like it for anybody who would like to say and share about my father. him at this time and like everyone says you know I didn't come I didn't come to help because I'm in the middle of the semester in grad school and he's like you have stuff to do you have places to be and he he just supported that no matter what um, I wish I had come and now in the middle of the semester um, in grad school I don't know how I'm going to get through it, but all I can think is I can't not get through it because that's what he would want me to do. Um, the past week going through all his things and his life has been really difficult because we both, we all knew how special he was and what he contributed to the world, but seeing it all at once, every day, over and over, was overwhelming. Um, and I was going through his office, and I found a folder with an essay I wrote in high school. It's a biography essay. Um, and it's about my dad. Um, and I'm going to read that to you. I'm a writer, I like to write. I got that from my dad. Um, and I, I wanted to write something really, really eloquent and special, but it's just not gonna happen. But this was on his desk and I feel like he had read it recently and I'm glad he read it recently because it's, it's all true still, just in different ways. Um, so let's start. So, um, Jeff cut off his finger when he was my age, but it has made him no less of a man. He used to stick his brown stub up his nose and pretend he had lost it there. <laughs> Soon I read that horrifying truth. I think he was hoping to prevent me from picking my nose. It didn't work. <laughs> my dad is built as strong as a bull and always cleans his plate. Supposedly because he came from rural West Virginia. We used to laboriously ride our bikes together, and when the wind would pick up, he would block it with his bull like figure. This made it twice as easy and twice as fun. He's never sick or ill, not on the outside, 
almost holding it in for the family's sake and others. And this forms him to be some sort of a personal Superman. He helps whoever he can, loves almost everyone, and judges, judges hardly anyone. No matter how harsh things become, he is still a Superman in our ready eyes. Never letting the unimportant things of this misleading world bother him, and never worrying about kryptonite. My father always loved to help me with my math homework, but I've had to break this tradition due to the 12-step algebra problems that are produced. His intelligence is like a rainbow filled with bright ideas that seem to never end. It flows across the world, reaching those who really see his bright colors. A prestigious by day, a psychologist in the distance, a dad at heart, and a superman in the eyes of all who saw his rainbow. My father is like a huge teddy bear with plenty of personality and mass to love and cherish. His eyebrows are black and bushy. They move up and down, always adding character to our conversations. His belly is big and round, a perfect pillow any day, and his voice is hardly ever raised above the sound of running water. Somehow it is soothing and comforting for any occasion. His black hair carries white and gray streaks that show the ages and wisdoms learned. Jeff wears thick, oddly shaped glasses that can be fun to try on and see into his world. My dad's skin is dark and tan, almost like it was reflecting the evening sun. He has a lot, very large feet, and a slip in bit of his shoes brings you to a walk on a wild side. It always seems my father knows the answers to all my questions for my unknown homework or a pop quiz on life or whether or not our country should be becoming a neighboring country. It's comforting to know he has it right most of the time. He encourages a feeling of safety that sweeps over my soul. He travels constantly, which is probably for the best because I don't think I could withstand his intelligence 24 hours a day. My father is such a simple man yet so complicated at the same time. It's really a confusing headache at my home and my dad must be right in the middle of it. Sometimes I ask him why life is how it is, just to find a question he can't answer. He manages to find a retort, but I know that this is one question he has no power to truly answer. My father holds controversial feelings in for the good of humanity. I know he uses them in other ways. He does this for others, not only for himself, and I admire this only with some concern for his own well-being. He works so hard and seems to like it, which is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. When he's upset, he blocks his computer to keep from starting too big of a dust cloud within our home. Now we're trying to talk it out while he's working. One word takes on a completely different meaning when his ears are set to work to block the arguing and anger. It's not for sure, but I believe he does this for others. To be patient, even during arguments, is a real gift. I've not seen it in anyone else. And then I can never do this. Therefore, my admiration for him grows with each sentence. Jeff has an odd sense of humor that can cheer you up in any situation. Of course, there are those times when you just want to slap him out of the fence or just plain annoyance. My father cracks jokes in any predicament, whether they're funny or not. The problem is that at a time when your laughter is crept away, but a smile wants to break free, even though most of the time it stays hidden. This does not discourage my father, another thing I admire him for. I usually don't show up, but he's interesting to be around. His jokes and his positive attitude are no matter when my personality leads me to a straight face, I'm still laughing inside. My father is special to me, not just because he's my dad, but because he's my friend and competition. Growing up around him has taught me some wonderful, intelligent, and strange things. Challenges have become a daily ritual, which I secretly enjoy. Debates are often won and lost, but to feel superior in his presence is a once in a lifetime opportunity. But only because of the intelligence he has given to me through his complicated ways. In my eyes and heart, he is a genius of a man and a genius of a father. His theories and questions lead to answers. This is something I love and look forward to each day. I also look forward to the great teddy bear hugs and his growth hormone, which he so easily disperses. He gives and learns more 
Keith Shannon continues to amaze me and the people around this world, I probably left a whole bunch out. Um, to clarify, when I say growth hormone, my dad used to come up to us and squeeze us and go, growth hormone, <laughs> to make us grow. <laughs> um, and I wrote this 18 years ago in, in high school. and. That's how I viewed my dad, and honestly, that's still how I viewed him now. Um, our competitiveness has mellowed. Um, it used to be fun to compete with him, and now we share tips on PowerPoints and, and research and editing, um, and that's been really special. Um, and that part, we go, wow. It's so weird, he works so hard. Well, I got all my work ethic from my dad. Um, it's to the point where you know you work for too much. <laughs> um, it's interesting because reading the tributes, you know, that gentle, soft spoken voice, you know, I'm also very sensitive, <laughs> well, very sensitive. And he used to say, I don't get mad. I'm like, Dad, you're mad. He's like, and it wasn't until after he was gone that I realized he didn't get mad. He felt mad, but he didn't get mad. So he was totally right. <laughs> um, and that's just the way he was. And he still seemed like a superman. Nothing was impossible with my dad. He seemed invinci invincible. Like he had all the answers. <laughs> Growing up, he always taught us to ask why, you know, be curious, learn, and now when I ask him questions and he, he tells me an answer and I'll say, why? And he's like, why are you asking me why? It's like, well, you taught me to do that. You taught me to ask why. And as a teenager, he really did seem like, like a superman. He sacrificed his own wants and sometimes he needs to help others. And now I've seen him in a much tougher light. He, he's not invincible, he's human, but he was so good at caring for other humans. Um, the last few years have been really great because we've become more, more like friends and he was so great to talk to. He was interesting to talk to. Um, and I'm lucky to have had that chance to share that part of my life with him, you know, moving from daughter to friend. <coughs> so, my dad was really, really special, and I know all of you know that. Um, and even from a young age, I knew that he was, he was Superman. Um, one thing I, I want to leave you with, because it's a memory that pops into my head a lot. Um, yeah, we, when, we moved, when we moved to Minnesota and he got a job at the Mayo Clinic, you know, it's so cold there. It is so <laughs> cold there. And we were driving and a man collapsed on the sidewalk. And my dad stopped the car and he got out and he took off his coat and he put it under the guy's head and he waited for the ambulance. I don't remember where we were going or what we were doing, but he he stopped out, and that's that's the way the way he was um, with everyone. And I think he instilled that in everyone else too. So done. Um,
just thank you. And, uh, <coughs> and, and, you know, and how many ways can we explore the word thank you? And um, I think it might not have been fully appreciated by his family how significant Jeff was in the Cartesian community. And he tried to capture some of that on the back here. But uh, it could not be overstated how important Jeff was to cardiovascular surgery particularly open heart surgery, uh, and his, his field of cardiovascular perfusion. Um, any academic perfusionist in the world would know his name. That's not an, understate, not a, not an overstatement or an exaggeration at all. If you've studied cardiovascular perfusion, you've read his articles. And the impact of his articles, the impact of his teaching, he's been the program director of numerous schools, He's been the educator of a major company, had 450 perfusionists under him. Um, he was responsible for their competency. Um, he's been involved in selecting perfusion students to join the program. So he's set people on their career. And through that vehicle, his hands and his mind and his heart has touched hundreds of thousands of patients, uh, not just in the United States, but uh, across the world. And as a number of us gather here, we all mentioned that there is nobody like him in our profession. There's nobody that can hold the candle to his legacy. Nobody's done as much. Um, and he has influenced our profession as much. Everything on the word thank you. So, thank you to the family for lending him to us. Because he was yours, you let him go. He was the best. Not, not every family would do that. You would see a family who would go on all that goodness for themselves. And he had more goodness than, than could be contained. Really appreciate it. I can speak for the profession. Thank you for letting him do everything he did for us. And the next very final thank you would be thank you to Jeff. To Jeff, he had the amazing ability to make you feel like he hand selected you. And I was sure he hand selected me. Uh, and it turns out he hand selected like all the people do. <laughs>
My name is Jane Kefferling, and I'm here with my husband, Bob. We um, came from Anderson, South Carolina for this sad occasion. And um, uh, we have known Jeff and Chris and their family since um, the early 70s. Um, mid-70s, I believe. Um, actually, I knew Jeff before I knew Chris, and um, I knew them when they were courting, and um, I knew them when, uh, when, they, uh, when they got married. So um, we go back a long way, and um, I've known them a long time, through thick and thin, and um, so uh, I have lots of stories, which I won't bore you with, but um, um, I know a lot of fun stories, I know some sad stories, but I know a lot, of, a lot of wonderful, happy stories about Jeff and Chris. But on the side, I want to tell Corey and Caitlin, this is the hardest thing you will ever do is to do an, a eulogy for a parent. I've had to do two myself, and that's the hardest thing ever, hardest day of your life, and you done, both did a beautiful job. And I feel your daddy's presence here, and I know he is extremely proud of both of you. You did a perfect job, and you couldn't have said anything more fine and wonderful, and I'm so proud of both of you. It's just beautiful what you said, and I just have to tell you that, because it was not easy. I know, I, I know how it is to have to do this, and um, another thing is life is not fair, and it's not fair what happened, and we don't understand it. We're, and I don't know that we ever will understand what happened, except um, the human body gives out. And so we just will understand one day, but today we don't. And we just have to leave that part in God's hands. Um, a funny thing about, um, about Jeff is that um, he married a saint, and I'm gonna tell you all that. He married a lady who um, was willing to move all over the country and uproot, uproot, uproot her house and go from pillar to post and all around the country. When I'm gonna tell you something, most ladies would not do that. <laughs> Every time I talked to Chris, she'd say, well, we're moving again, we're moving again. Hey, Chris, how y'all doing? Oh, we're moving again. <laughs> I said, Chris, uh, where y'all moving? Oh, well, we're moving across country. I said, Chris, where y'all moving now? Oh, well, we're in California, but we're moving to South Carolina. Chris, where y'all going now? Well, we're going to Minnesota. Well, Chris, where y'all going now? Well, we're going to New York. Where y'all going now? Well, we're going to Charleston. Where y'all go? Oh, my goodness. Chris, y'all... Y'all not staying still very long. Oh, well, I'm packing up again. Every time I talk to her, they were moving again, moving again. I said, Chris, how are y'all doing? It? Well, we're just packing up. We're packing up. Just got another offer at another big university. They're going again. And that girl, she would go. She packed up. And not too many wives would do that. I have to admit, I, I'm a homebody. I like to make a nest, and I like to stay there. But Chris, being the sweet, dear, faithful, loving wife that she is, I'm telling you, we sing in Jeff's praises, I'm gonna sing that girl's praises. <laughs> she would pack her stuff up and she would go and they would make their nest and they would stay there for a while and pretty soon off they go again. Now I say that because we were next door neighbors. When the, uh, I knew Jeff and Chris when I worked at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And so we were next door neighbors, and we were good neighbors because um, we were the kind of neighbors, I don't know, y'all may have had some neighbors like this where 
you're such close back door, side door neighbors that we'd put on our bathrobe and our slippers and we'd run across the grass and I, I wouldn't even knock, I'd knock a little bit and go, ooh, -hoo. and come, we'd go in and I'd say, what y'all doing, how about some coffee? And she'd come over my house in her bathroom and slippers and she'd come in and we'd have our little visits and Jeff would, Jeff would put on his clothes, he didn't come over his bathroom. <laughs> But we would, uh, we would visit like that, and that was the best kind of neighbors, and we were good friends, and Chris was the best cook ever. And so she'd teach me a lot of her recipes, and so we would neighbors like that, and that's just the best kind of neighbors to ever have. And um, we had babies together, and um, so we just were best friends and kept up. When they moved away, we always kept up, and, and um, kept in touch and everything and so we enjoyed being next door neighbors but it wasn't long after they moved there just a, a few years she come over the back road with coffee and slippers and she said well guess what we got to move again i said no please don't move y'all the best neighbors so we were so sorry when they left but um remained friends and um while they were there i tell you this while they were there um jeff as and Jeff does everything, you know, so well. So, so he's, he just did build, he, he was building things and he would build it perfectly, you know, right to specs. And so he built a picnic table. And I mean, he did it exactly, I don't even know if he had instructions, but he built it. That thing wasn't rickety at all, it didn't wobble. I mean, it was built solid. It didn't wobble. You'd sit on it and you'd go, boy, this thing is sturdy. In fact, it was so sturdy, we could hardly pick it up because it's so heavy to put it in the trailer to move it one, one day. So that thing, he said, when it was time to move it, he said, it's too heavy, we can't move it, it's so big. So he said, Jane, I'm going to give it to y'all. I said, that's so sweet. Because well, he's teddy bear, good old, good teddy bear kind of neighbor who loved us. So. We still have that picnic table from way long back when they lived in Atlanta. So we love that picnic table. It's the Jeff Riley Memorial picnic table that we still have. So he would just would give you things, and that was one the thing that he left with us. We talked about that yesterday. So um, uh, just have, you know, everyone has countless stories of Jeff, and that's a favorite thing. Um, that we remember, and um, he could fix anything because he was kind of had that engineering mind, and um, so we just enjoy that. And of course, the children would carve their names in it. And, um, but uh, something about whenever they traveled or moved away, we would run into them when we would travel, and we would meet them up. Well, like one time they lived in. Um, California, and we would meet them there. There they were. Y'all lived there, didn't you? Yep. So we happened to be there. Bob and I were there, and we'd see them there. And then, then we'd see them somewhere else. We'd see them. And, I mean, they just moved all over. But um, it, it kind of struck me. I hadn't even planned to talk. So this is unprepared. I'm sorry. I'm jumping around. But. Um, it kind of struck me, and I'm no preacher, so give me a little leeway here. But it struck, struck me a little bit um, that there's a ver you know there's a verse in the Bible for everything. So it um, it it kind of reminded me of um, in the book of John, chapter 14. Um, uh, Jesus is talking about. Um, uh, pertaining to Jeff moving so much that Jesus has prepared a place for Jeff. Um, even in his moving around so much that Jesus has prepared a place for him there. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to that there myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. 
So there are many rooms there where Jeff will be and he'll have many places to go and enjoy. So if he gets tired of one room, he can move around <laughs> and go to other rooms. And then he can go to other rooms. And then even there might be a big back porch and it might overlook a beautiful lake because we know he liked to ride in a boat. He took me skiing one time. There might be a big beautiful field where he can play, play rugby. And so Jesus has prepared this beautiful place for him to be. And it will be perfect. And the first thing I thought of when I heard this tragedy about Jeff, my first thought was, I know he's in heaven. And I know he's in a perfect place. And even though we are sad today, we're sad, we must take comfort in the fact that he is in a perfect place and we will see him again. And I want to I tell you, you're a precious family and you loved him with all your heart while you were with him. But you will see him again. God bless you. Anybody else want to say anything? We've heard from family. We've heard from friends. And honestly, a beautiful thank you. We're reminded of what we do here on earth changes lives. We're reminded of what Jesus did for us as he prepares a place for us. It's in the book of Isaiah that we read these words. But those who trust in the Lord will find strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and be not faint. It's in times like this that many times we feel like we just plot along the way one step at a time. We don't know where to turn. We don't know what to do. We're not sure what life holds. It seems like all of a sudden there's this huge roadblock and we have to work our way around it. Corey and Caitlin... Chris, know that we're praying for you and we love you. But know that God has a plan. He already started, as Jane said, to build that house. Many years ago, he's prepared it. It's built. Chris, I want you to know how much we love you. We always have for so long. You are like a big sister to us in so many ways. Obviously, your brother was like my brother. But know that you'll see him again someday. There's a poem that just simply says, just think. Just think of stepping on shore and finding heaven. Of taking hold of a hand and finding it God's hand. Of breathing new air and finding it celestial. Of waking up and finding your home. Jeff is finally home. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for a life that truly has changed countless thousands of people. Father, from university to state to state, moving from place to place to impact more and more along the way. Father, so many sit in this room today and just touch their heart in one way or another. So many others that are across the country that maybe doing surgery right now, maybe working in a profession right now because of something that Jeff did and some impact that he had in their life. And we thank you for that. Father, I thank you for him being the father whose kids it needed to be. For him being the husband to his wife. Father, I thank you for providing for them and loving them. Father, right now, I thank you for their comfort. Father, that many times they may not know where to turn. They may not know what the future holds, but help them to always know who holds the future. That it's you. And when they 
at times of sorrow and sadness that they can turn to you. They can pick up the phone and call a friend, even if they're thousands of miles away, to hear their voice, to hear the words of encouragement. Father, I pray that you would help Corey and Caitlin to feel those hands upon their shoulders daily, to know that their dad is watching over them each and every day. Thank you for the promise of home, a final resting place where we can wake up in a land and you said, well done, good and faithful servant. Be with the family today and always. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Um, to Chris, Corey, and Caitlin, again, my sympathies to you. Uh, my name is Aaron. I'm a funeral staff here at your Funeral Home. I would like to thank all of you for coming to support the family. Um, I didn't know Jeff. I've learned a lot about Jeff and his career. I had no idea what a fusionist was. So I guess that's the point. He's still teaching. Um, the visitation will continue, so please continue to share memories of Jeff. And again, thank you for coming. Can you put the music back?